Lesson 10.2D, Using Proportions to Make Inferences. If a sample is representative of the population, then the number of objects in the population with a given characteristic is proportional to the number of objects in the sample with that characteristic. Wow, what does that mean? Okay, well here's an example. If we choose a random sample of 100 radios out of a shipment of 1,000 radios and find that two have defective battery compartments, we can use proportional reasoning to infer how many of the 1,000 have defective battery compartments. If two out of 100 have defective battery compartments, then we can say X out of 1,000 will have defective battery compartments. We can use data based on a random sample along with proportional reasoning to make inferences or predictions about the population. We have two defective radios found out of 100 random sample. The population was 1,000. We have X defective radios out of a 1,000 population of radios. As a proportion, we have two one hundredths is equal to 20 one thousandths. Our inference is that 20 of the 1,000 radios in the shipment have defective battery compartments. When writing our proportion, we may want to write our proportion in simplest terms to make calculations easier. Two one-hundredths didn't need to be written in simplest terms since the population of the shipment was 1,000. We have two one-hundredths is equal to x one-thousandths. 1,000 is a multiple of 100. Now look at this proportion. We have three-twelfths is equal to x one-hundredths. For this proportion, calculations are easier once 3 twelfths is simplified to 1 fourth. We have 1 fourth is equal to x 1 hundredths. Well, we know 25 1 hundredths is 1 fourth. We know x is equal to 25. In this proportion, it was easier to simplify first. 30,000 people voted in a mayoral election. Of 150 voters surveyed, 90 said they voted for candidate A. Use proportional reasoning to make an inference of the number of votes candidate A received. So candidate A got 90 of 150 voters that were surveyed. That's our random sample, 150. 90 of them said they voted for candidate A. Our population is 30,000, so it's equal to x over 30,000. If we simplify 90 one fiftieths, we get 3 fifths. 3 fifths, this 5 needs to be multiplied by 6,000 to be 30,000, so we need to multiply the numerator by 6,000. That gives us an inference of 18,000. So based on the sample, we can predict that candidate A received about 18,000 votes. So we found that candidate A got about 18,000 votes. That was our prediction. We can use estimation to check if our answer is reasonable. 90 is a little more than half of 150, and 18,000 is a little more than half of 30,000, so yes, it's reasonable. And this is a quantitative inference. We discussed earlier in the other videos about a qualitative inference. This has to do with quantity, so it's a quantitative inference. Using proportional reasoning to make inferences of a population from a random sample will not give us precise information. Random samples and proportional reasoning can only be used to make predictions. Though these predictions may be close to the actual value, it is possible for a prediction to be inaccurate. Now, when do we know to use a dot plot compared to a box plot? Well, we use a dot plot when the data values repeat. 
Here's our data values. We have a couple of twos. We have three threes. So a dot plot would work because we could stack the two dots on top of each other and the three dots above the three. When to use a box plot? When the data values are all different. When we want to show the median and the range. So if these are our data values. If we had put these in a dot plot, we would have just had one dot above each number. That wouldn't make sense. This would be best for these data values to be in a box plot. Now I mentioned in a previous video that we learned about box plots and dot plots and interquartile ranges and all of this back in sixth grade math in chapter 16. Well, in lesson 16.4c, we learned about outliers. Don't know if you remember, don't know if you learned it in sixth grade. An outlier is a data value that is much greater or much less than the other values in the set. And outliers can skew an average. Here we have some data values, and if you look, they're all pretty close to each other. We have a 0, a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, and then all of a sudden we have a 16. That's way greater than the other numbers. If we did the average without the outlier, if we didn't count this, we would get 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 divided by 6. There are six values that we're adding. That would give us a 12 divided by 6. That would give us an average of 2. Now, if we include the outlier, now we're adding all of these digits, and now we've got to divide it by 7 because we've got 7 data values. We're going to get 28 divided by 7. Our average is going to be 4. So do you see how without the outlier, our average was 2, but with the outlier, our average was 4? So that outlier skewed the average and made it more because it was so different than the other data values. I'm going to have a link to this video from 6th grade in the description if you didn't learn this last year and you need a real quick refresher. It's only a few minutes long. We're finished with Lesson 10.2. We're going to be moving on to 10.3, and we're going to learn about generating a random sample using technology. Do you have a scientific calculator? If you do, it'll be very helpful for the next lesson. So keep in mind, if the random sample and the population, when you're looking at those two numbers, if the population is a multiple of that random sample, you don't need to simplify it. But in some cases, like this 3 twelfths, it might be better to make it a 1 fourth so that your math is easier to do. The calculations are easier. Okay, have a wonderful day, of course, as always, and join me for the next lesson. Bye.